I changed my mind as Mike was speaking this afternoon about what I was going to speak on uh, this evening, partly because, um, you know, one of the things that Mike was saying that really st struck home with me again was the, the idea that um, we move in the gifts of the Spirit and the things of the Spirit when we know that it's not about us. Uh, when we're really dependent and we rest and we understand that it's all on Him and we do it in our weakness and, uh, and then we can, we can be easy, not because we've got it all together, but because we know that he's in control. And um, I, like, even as he was saying that, I was feeling, oh my word, that's a lesson that I just still haven't learned. I've been absolute stress head for the last three days, trying to get ready for this, uh, stressing for a lot of the afternoon. And I, I, I am there sometimes, but also lots of the time I'm not. And I don't know if you find um, that you can come to a conference or go to church on a Sunday or just be reading your Bible and God really shows you something, that like you really get it and someone says something you think, yeah, like, and it's not just that it, you, you agree intellectually, it's like it chimes with your spirit and you're like, yes, this is right. And then, um, you know, not even a day later, you, you're totally not living from that place and it's as if you almost never knew it, you've forgotten all about it. And uh, I, I was just thinking just the other day about a time when I was, um, some years ago now, I was speaking at a university like house party where these students go away from a Christian union and I was just doing some talks and I remember chatting over dinner with some of the students who got really enthusiastic about the Holy Spirit and they were saying, tell us about the Holy Spirit, how do you get filled with the Spirit? And so I explained to them very confidently how one got filled with the Holy Spirit because I was quite good on the theory. And then they, um, and then they said, well, could we do that now? And I said, now? They said, now? And I said, well, okay, because I, I was too embarrassed to say no because I just so confidently explained to them how you got filled with the Holy Spirit. So we went after dinner and we just sat in the corner of this room and this girl who had just become a Christian and so didn't know anything any better I thought I knew something so she said would you pray for us that you know for me to be filled with the Holy Spirit so I said fine so we prayed and um, to my utter astonishment the Holy Spirit actually turned up really met with her and I, and I remember just just being blown they didn't seem surprised I, I, I really was shocked and um, you know everything that Mike said about Peter and John earlier about how they didn't take any glory and they just gave it all to Jesus why are you staring at us I did the complete opposite of that um, and, and I was explaining this is how it happens this is as if it happens to me every single time like that and then I remember thinking as I was driving home wow Shame on me, there I was explaining the theory to them, but if I hadn't, it was out of embarrassment that I prayed for her to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That was my motivation. And so I was pretty hot on the theory, but when it came to the actual lived reality, the lived practice, that's where I fell down. That's where I tripped up. And I wonder um, how common that is in, in the church, as Mike was saying again this afternoon, like, you know, the name charismatic, we can believe the charismatic theory. Um, oh yeah, I believe that God speaks today through normal people, but just not through this normal person. Uh, I believe that God heals today, but when I pray for healing, I'm not expecting anything to happen. I, you know, I believe that people get filled with the Spirit when they seek the Spirit of God, but don't ask me to pray for you to be filled with the Spirit because I'm, I'd, be, I'd be amazed if anything happened. We believe the theory, but sometimes that doesn't always translate into our lived action. And so really the question I want to look at is how is it that we can hear stuff, hear truth, and yet it not ever really lead us to a place where we, our behavior is transformed and we're operating from a place of freedom and a place of confidence because really that's what it comes down to. It's really confidently knowing these things. We, we act most of the time, not all of the time, but just almost instinctively without thinking. We just act from stuff that's just in us or it isn't. And so when I go home and visit my parents, one of the things that my wife tells me is that I revert to being a 15-year-old boy. I walk into the house, I hand my children over to my mother and say, you wanted grandchildren, here they are. Enjoy for the next three hours or whatever it is. And then I'll just go and sit on the sofa and watch a film and expect my dad to bring me food. And, and I do it, I'm not trying to do that. I, I'm, I'm just, that's just in me because I'm so, this is my, these are my people, they love me, I am their child. I have, that no one's trying to convince me of that. I know it deep inside and so my behavior flows from this deep inner confidence that I have. 
And in the same way, when we think about how do I move forward in the naturally supernatural, I've listened to the talks and I've read the books and I've, you know, I've been to the conferences year after year after year after year. And every year at the end of the year, it feels like this time I'm going to do it. This time I'm going to make some progress. This time in my small group or in my church or just in my work life, I'm going to begin to, to step forward. And if you looked at it as a snapshot on the last day of a conference, then we look like those statues that you see in marketplaces, muscles bunched, ready to leap. And then it feels like, I don't know about you, but sometimes a whole year later, we just are stuck in the same place, like a statue. And we haven't broken through and we haven't gotten anywhere. How can we begin to see breakthrough? Well, I think one of the answers to that uh, can be found in a passage that I want to read to you. If you've got your Bible, I want to open it up to uh, John chapter 8. And uh, this to me, as I've looked at this in the last few weeks, has really kind of opened some th- my eyes to something that I hadn't quite realized was going on uh, to the extent that I get it a bit more now. So um, verse 31 says this. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will know this famous verse. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then he ends up having this dialogue with the Jewish leaders. So it says, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. Basically, Jesus says, no, he isn't. So he says, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Wrong again, basically, is what Jesus says. So it says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. Boom! doesn't say that, but it should. You belong to your father, the devil. We think Jesus is meek and mild, and then you actually read what he says. And then he goes off, and you carry out your father, your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. And one of the things I wonder, in fact I know, one of the things that's going on when when we hear truth, whether it's the truth that Mike was talking this afternoon about, it's in weakness and his grace is sufficient and all of that. When we hear that truth, we get it, but there's another agent at play in the world besides God, and it is Satan. It's the devil. And Satan, one of his, one of his primary aims is to undermine our, our understanding of God's truth. It's to shake it from us. And so this is a strategy that's been going on as long as human beings have been around. In the Garden of Eden, Satan appears to Eve, and he doesn't come to her with, with, a, with a, like a gun or a sword or a tank. His weapon is a lie. And he says to Eve, if you, you know, if you eat this, you'll become like God. Sorry, Eve should have said, I already am like him. He made me in his image. But she falls for the trick. Jesus, when he comes on the scene, has that wonderful moment at his baptism where the Father, the Spirit fills him and the Father speaks truth over him. You are my son whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. And the very next thing that happens is Jesus goes off into the wilderness where Satan comes and attempts to steal that truth away from him. So he starts to say to him, if you really were the son of God, then this and that. 
And he did it to Jesus, he did it to Eve, and he's been doing it to us. Satan is real, he is interested in us. And what he does is he attacks us. He wants to rob us, not just of the truth of our identity in Jesus Christ, but also of the reality that our Father is advancing his kingdom here and now, and we are agents of that advancement. He doesn't want us believing that for obvious reasons. And so uh, what he tries to do is the moment we might get a handle on it or see it for a second, he tries to snatch it away. Uh, Do you remember the parable of the sower where the farmer goes out and sows his seed? And the first thing that happens is some seed falls on a path and we're told that a bird comes and snaps it up. And what the bird is, is, is when Jesus explains the parable, the bird is Satan. And what he does is he comes and snaps it away. So there is a, um, if you like, a battle taking place within us constantly, and it's uh, this fight that we have a little bit with Satan, and before fighting Satan is about demons and exorcism, it's the battle to believe God's truth over Satan's lies. And the arena where that battle takes place is the mind. It takes place here. One of the things that I've been doing over the last couple of months is um, playing quite a bit of squash, So I've been playing squash with some old friends of mine. And one of the things I've realized as I've played squash is that I'm really bad at squash. Every single game I've played with these old school friends, I have lost. Just last week, I played six games and I lost all six of them. And I've been trying to work out why is it it that I keep losing? So there are some obvious reasons. I have very little hand-eye coordination. Uh, I've never really played squash much in my life before. But there's another one because there have been a few games where I've come quite close to winning. And, uh, you know, it's like I've thought to myself, hey, I've got nothing to lose. I'm useless at this game, so I'll just have a crack at it. So I'll just, like, you know, just swing. I'm not even looking at the ball. I'll manage to hit a good shot. And I found myself a couple of times in these positions where really at this point I should win the game. It's like, A, I've only got to get to nine. You're on five. I'm serving. This should happen. But then what happens to me in those moments is, is suddenly it occurs to me, I don't know if you can relate to this, that I might actually win. And the moment, I, up until that point, I've been fairly relaxed. But the moment it, I realize, oh my word, I think I could actually beat them, all of my muscles tense up, and my hand-eye coordination, what little I have, runs for the hills. And so I am left, suddenly I can't hit anything anywhere, and, and then I lose. And uh, the place that I'm losing it is I'm losing it, not in my hand-eye coordination, actually, but here. In my head, suddenly the pressure has got to me. Have you ever watched like a tennis match or a football game? And it's like you can tell. Sometimes the commentators say they're playing without belief. They're playing with no sense of self-belief. And so the performance dips. What I've been doing as a way of helping myself is scheduling in a few more games with Mike. And suddenly my confidence is sky high again. (laughs) But I... Ask him what the score was. But I... I, um, uh, uh, like another example, I remember watching the, the West Wing. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but there's this line in the West Wing. It's talking about elections. Leo McGarry says to somebody else, he says, elections are won and lost on one square foot of real estate right here. We're probably not all politicians or like high-level athletes or whatever, but we all experience, basically it's called choking. Yeah, and I bet you, maybe, maybe this is just me again, but I don't think it will be. I bet all of us have experienced this when we've attempted to parallel park, when somebody else is watching. Have you ever had that? So like, I can actually parallel park, I promise you. But then if you find, if you're in a car together and then I'm trying to parallel park and all these streets in Watford are really narrow and there's cars everywhere, so there's only room for one car. I'm trying to parallel park when somebody's actually watching me parallel park, then suddenly I can't do it. Suddenly, like, I'm just going in at the most random angles. I'll allow myself three attempts and then what I'll do is I'll drive away and I'll blame the space. It was the space's fault that I didn't manage it. And what's fascinating to me and the lesson from that is that is actually what's going on in here, we don't often realize it, but what is happening in here affects our hands. It affects our behavior. And um, the, the, the way that we're told to address this, one of the ways is Romans chapter 12, verse two. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
And I used to think that the way that we got our minds transformed is we just had truth kind of poured into it, but we were fairly passive in that process. But what I've realized now is that actually is not how it works. So um, I'd never spotted this before until a few weeks ago, but if you look back at um, John chapter 8, starting verse 31, I'll read it to you again. To the Jews who have believed him, Jesus said, here's the key bit, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. And so truth, I used to think of it as a thing that just got poured into, but it's actually, it's more like this thing that it can come in one ear and out the other. And what our, one of our roles, one of the things that we can do is grab it. When it comes in, hold it. Satan, what he tries to do is snatch it, and our role is to seize it. And so when we talk about whatever particular truth that we're going to be looking at over the next few sessions, one of the things that for me I want to be doing a little bit more is how can I, how can I not just hear this now in this moment and get it just for five minutes, but how can this become something that I know in my guts so that it leads me to a place of freedom and it leads me to a place of confidence? How does this get in here so that I really know it, know it? And to answer that, I want to suggest three things that can be helpful for holding on to whatever truth it is that we're trying to get into our systems. Um, the first one is the scripture. We're just going to look at these in, in a moment. The first one is the scripture. The second one is the spirit. And the third one is what I've called the saints. And all I mean by that is the normal people that we sit next to, but I wanted three S's. The scripture, the spirit, and the saints. How does the scripture help us hold on to truth? One of the ways that it helps us is um, because it is the main way that God speaks to us. It's not the only way, but it's the main way. And so when Jesus is tested in the wilderness, what he does is he replies, well, it is written. You know, Satan comes to him with his accusation. Jesus replies three times, it is written. It's his weapon against the enemy. And what we're not doing here is we're not earning something or making something true. We're just holding on to the fact that something is already true that we are all called to the priesthood of all believers, that the, minister, the whole ministry of Jesus is available for the whole church of Jesus, that God wants to give us good gifts. We're not making that true by repeating a scripture. We're just holding on to the fact that it is true. And um, when we talk about the patterns of the mind, one of the things that uh, has been like studied quite a lot recently in neurochemistry and all sorts of stuff like that is this idea that we, in our brains, our brains, they develop patterns. Our minds develop habits and particular ways of thinking. And uh, what happens as, as we think a particular thought is every time we think it, it becomes easier to think it tomorrow. And so the way that I heard one person describe it to me really helpfully was it's like a jungle. It's like your mind is like a jungle. And you've got you to hack a path through it. So you get your machete out one day and you just hack a path through the jungle. And then imagine you come back the following week and you go down the same path and you get the machete out again, you hack it down again. So the path becomes a little bit more set. And then you do that a third time and a fourth time. Well, by the time you've done that for a few weeks, that path is really, really clearly formed. And so what can happen is your mind very easily goes off down that path. And the moment you're under any pressure, there's a, the, the moment there's kind of stress going on and things happening in our life, then that's the path of least resistance. That's the easy way to go. So that's where you head straight away. And what happens to us as we grow up is the world forms a particular pattern, a particular way of thinking. Also, what happens is Satan whispers his favorite thing to whisper, lies to us. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He's exceptionally good at it. So he whispers a little lie to us, and we take it up, and we begin to think it, and we begin to dwell on it. And so let's say the lie that he whispers to us, maybe you recognize this one, is God won't use you. And he'll tack something on that makes it a bit personal because you don't have any faith or because you did this or because you don't pray enough or because you're not like this, whatever. But it's like, but it's God won't use you. One of the things I've noticed he's added to that lie uh, as well over the years is this time. Maybe he did last time, but it won't be this time. And we can begin to meditate on that. So that becomes something that we, that we hold on to. It's like a common thing. Then what can happen is we, we read our scripture or we come to church or we chat to a friend and they speak some truth to us. So they might speak a truth. Like, for example, one of the things that Mike quoted at the start of this meeting, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, where the Lord says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. 
my power is made perfect in weakness. And that just lands on us for a moment. And we like that. And we say yes and amen to it. But because our deeply entrenched way of thinking is the lie, God won't use me or God can't use me, then that truth just hovers on the surface of us for a moment and then it's very quickly kind of like brushed away. And this is where we have a role to play in working out what God is working in. And there is a place that we have for retraining our minds. This was like a big thing for me to discover this a little while ago. It's like, I I always thought that you can't help what you think about. You just end up just thinking about stuff. And actually, in the scripture, there are all these instructions about setting your mind on stuff. So it says, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Now, why would it say that if we had no choice about what we're thinking about? Uh, It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, famous verse, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And so the mind is actually like a bit like a body, and that what we do is we feed it. And food, you know, as with the body, food doesn't impact the body until it's internalized. So as long as it's sitting there on the plate, it's not having any impact on the inside of our body. But when we begin to internalize the food, that's when it begins to work for good or for ill, depending on whether it's carrots or cheesecake. And in the same way with, with, with um, thoughts, truth and lies have no impact on us when they're just floating around in the atmosphere somewhere. The, the way that they begin to work in us is when we begin to internalize that truth or internalize that lie. And it either works towards our ruin or it works towards our thriving and towards our kind of like uh, uh, flying. And so some of the truths that I've been like, how can I begin to feed myself with have been things like Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? That's a truth you can chew on for a while. Here's another one, Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? One of the things that my wife loves is uh, chocolate. She's really into it. And we've been married for almost 10 years now. So I have been, over the years, trying to find ways of um, hiding chocolate from her. Because I also like chocolate. Um, But the difference is, I take my time eating it over a period of days, whereas she will just smash one bar in about 30 seconds. So I've realized that if I want to be able to live in the way that I want to live, I have to hide it. And I've tried all sorts of hiding places. Believe me, I've tried like, you know, in the wardrobes, I've tried it in the garage. But what happened was, sooner or later, she will just get fidgety and she will go out and she will look for it and she will find it and so I have realized there there is uh I have actually found a place now where she doesn't she can't get her hands on it this is the only place I found in 10 years where if I put it there it's safe do you know what it is here (laughs) if it's here she can't get it and I realize that very unfortunately I'm comparing her to Satan in this analogy but (laughs) don't tell her all right, because I will be in trouble. But it's like this. It's like he wants to snatch it. There's one place you can put it here. Internalize it. Now, now that's more than memorize. Memorize can help with that, but it, it's meditate on it. It's get it in our system. When Beth and I started dating, one of the things that I loved was that I went into her room at university and she just had a whole wall of post-it notes. Every, every post-it note was a verse that God has spoken to her. It says uh, in the Old Testament that what they would do is they would write the law on their doorposts and write it on their foreheads. They would find any and every way they could to get it into them. And so what we can do is when the lie begins to come, God won't use me, God won't use me, not this time, not this time. Then, then, and it's clunky at first, but we can begin to say, I'm thinking about what I'm thinking about now. Now, and I'm recognizing that that's a lie that I'm believing. So I'm going to choose to switch from thinking about that to thinking about something else. The good gifts of the Father that he wants to give. Or the fact that he's already given us his only son. So why would he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? And, and again, it's, it's weird developing a new habit. It's a bit like learning to drive. Do you remember that? It was so clunky. You know, you're like going from first gear crunched into second gear. And then take off when you do a hill start and all that. But after a while, you begin to get the hang of it. It becomes normal. That's what I'm talking about. Finding a way of setting our mind on the truths of God is a way of beginning to break free and move forwards. 
Another way of internalizing the scripture is to actually act like we believe it. How would I live if I really truly believe this? So one friend of mine was telling me that his, uh, one of his, his great struggles was to really internalize that truth that God is your father and that he loves you. And he said one day he, just, he, he was just seeking, seeking God on it. He just felt like God said to him, how would you act if you did believe it? And he, he thought about that. He, he was a, a father. He had a little girl. And he, uh, he said he just he loved her so much. He said sometimes she, she would go to sleep and he would just want to wake her up. He would want to wait. He couldn't wait for her to wake up in the morning. As a father of young children, I have never had that problem. But he was, he was like, oh, man, I just want her to wake up so we can be together. And then they would wake up and they'd have this great time. And, and he, he said to himself, do you know what? God is a better dad than I could ever be. So, so, so maybe he feels about me in the way that I feel about my little girl. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to act as if that were true. What would that look like? And so he decided the next morning when he woke up that he was just going to start the day by saying, Hey, Dad. Hey, I bet you've been watching me all night. I bet you've been wanting to wake me up. Well, here I am. He started his day like that. And he said, I felt so stupid starting my day like that. But I decided I was going to do it again the next day. So the next day he did it. He woke up. Hey, hey, Dad. Hey, I'm here. I woke up half an hour early for you. Shall we hang out together? And then he did it again and again. And he said, you know what? After he'd been doing that for some time, one morning he woke up and he almost screamed. Because he said it felt as if God was right in his face. And the love of the Father was, was right there. And the truth is, there's, there's this old saying about knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in a muscle. And what it means is it's only when we do it that we get it. That old Chinese proverb, is, I, 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 I hear, I forget, I see, I, I remember, I do, I understand. I do, I understand. How would, how would my life look if I acted like I believed that God wanted to speak through me to people around? That God wanted to heal people through me? that God wanted me to move in the, in the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit, what would, what would that look like? Scripture. Secondly, the Spirit. Um, you know what? If it's our role to write it on our doorposts and our foreheads, then it's the role of the Spirit to write it on our hearts. And it says in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 15, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. I love that. It's a cry of the heart. It's not just a, oh, you're my dad. It's like, Dad, by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And with this, part of it is understanding, as we were saying at the start of the, the conference, about the role of the presence of God. And actually, the role that the presence of God has in our receiving and knowing truth deep in our guts, because presence communicates on a level that words cannot. And so imagine that there's like a little teenage kid or something like that, and every time he, he goes off to a sports match, his dad says, cheering you on, as he leaves. And then he looks over at the touchline, and there's nobody there. After about five or six months of, of the dad saying, cheering you on, as he heads off and looks over and there's no one there, probably that boy is not going to feel like he's being particularly cheered on. But if you reverse the scenario, and rather than dad saying, I'm cheering you on, dad was just there, come rain or shine, standing, watching, then that would communicate to his boy something far deeper than the words. And the words matter. Imagine, uh, you know, uh, like if you, if you were just to spend an, an evening kind of sitting by a fire with an old friend and you barely spoke. The two of you just sat there for hours having a glass of wine or whatever. And then at the end, you just, you just said a few words. I fool you. I love doing life with you. My bet is that those words would sink into the soul, not least in part because you've just been sitting in one another's presence, not doing anything, but just being there. Our Catholic brothers and sisters have developed this whole ministry around being with those who are sick and those who are dying in stillness and in silence, maybe just holding a hand, not doing anything else because they understand that presence communicates something deep and something rich. And when we talk about being in God's presence, that's one of the things that happens. His presence communicates to us. His love and his life, it softens us. 
um, when I became a follower of Jesus, I was, I was really hardened by, by lots of things, incredibly set in my ways and set in my behavioral patterns and my thought patterns. And there was a whole load of stuff that I just couldn't get my head around. No matter, no matter how many times people spoke it to me, it just remained a theory. And I remember Mike just saying to me at one point, just go, any opportunity that there is for prayer, just go up. And so whatever happened for about six months, whatever the invitation was to come forward, it could have been for women in ministry, and I would have come up, and I stood there, and I just got prayed for time and time and time again. And what happened over that time is that God just began to soften me. It's a bit like a natural sponge. You know, you can get those from like the body shop and stuff. They're like really crusty and hard, and you drop it in the bath. Nothing happens for a while. And then after a while, that hardened crust just begins to soften, and it begins to soak up the water. As we spend time in the presence of our Father, then gradually we become softer too. And so what happens is a drop of truth can fall from heaven, and rather than it bouncing on a a tin can and, and kind of jumping off, it hits a sponge. And we soak it up. The Spirit helps us get it. And lastly, uh, the saints. Hebrews chapter 3, that's each other. Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 13 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. And instead of that, it says, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today. I love that. So when it's no longer called today, we don't have to encourage each other anymore. But as long as it is today, we need to do this. Uh, So that none of you may be hardened by sins for deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. One of the things about Satan is that he is most effective when we are most isolated. It's no coincidence that Eve was alone when Satan came to her with his whispers. And that's when we're most likely to believe his lies. And so, again, one of the images that I have in my mind when we talk about God reveals a particular truth to us about how this is for you you and this is for me, is it's a bit like he he puts in our hand like like a rope. And then we have to hold on to the rope. We have to hold on to this truth. And then it's as if a tug of war begins and Satan is trying to snatch that truth out of our hands. Do you know what helps in a tug of war? Having some buddies having some friends who can come and be on your end of the rope and hold on to it too. So that when he's trying to pull, suddenly you've got some backup and now it's a team sport. And that's the way it's meant to work is that we cheer each other on and we encourage each other. And so whatever truth it is that we're taking away over the next few days, it's like we want to hold on to that with some other people who've been there before. And we're not ta- what we're not talking about is a, is a culture of positive thinking or let's just pretend that the world isn't actually very hard and we can just say nice things to each other and that will make it real. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is this is a culture of encouragement. So we say, look, it looks difficult because it is and it seems hard because it is and it sucks because it sucks because this is tough. But let me say to you, I have been in a place like this before and have found that God has proved himself faithful time and time and time again. Again, I see that you're in pain and I see that you're suffering, but don't forget, do you remember that time a few years ago when we went through the mill, but God was there standing all the way through? Don't you remember? I know this is a hard thing for you, but let me speak some truth to you. That's what it is to speak truth in love, not correct people all the time. It's to, it's to speak the encouragement of the God of love over them and say, he's with you. He's got your back. I know you're afraid. I know you feel like you've only gone like two millimeters in the last six months in growth in your relationship with God, but let me say to you, keep going and keep hanging in there. We're in it together. That's what it is to be saints walking side by side, having each other's back, cheering one another on. As long as it's called today, let's encourage one another. What we'll find as we do this, and I finish with this, is uh, that we walk more and more into the freedom that God has for us. My little boy Judah, two years old, Uh, just at the beginning stages of potty training. And uh, just think about this. Judah, 100% of his his life, his entire life, he has been in nappies. And so he knows nothing else apart from just having this really bulky thing kind of strapped to you unless you're in the bath. That's his entire world. And what we're trying to do is help Judah to realize there is another way, Judah. 
there's another way to live. You can live without this thing strapped to you. And we're using all sorts of techniques to try and open his eyes. The main one is sweets, okay? So we'll stick, we'll go, we'll look, here's a, here's a Thomas the Tank Engine potty. Why don't we sit you on there? And the other week he managed it for the first time. He sat on this potty and he did a wee on the potty. And Beth and I both went potty when he did a wee on the potty. We were like, you've done it, my boy. Yeah, woohoo. You know, to give you a sticker and let's give you a sweet. And he was so pleased with himself. And you could see the lights came on for him. And he was like, oh my my word, I can literally just pee anywhere. <laughs> and, and what's happened there for Judah is, is it's like he's had a revelation almost that there is, there's a different way to do things. But you see, that's the beginning of freedom. That's not the whole journey. The whole journey is currently happening. We have a mop and bucket waiting. <laughs> As he walks on the journey, he's making mistakes everywhere. <laughs> but he's walking on the journey, and he's going to get there. And you see, when we have the revelation, like the one I was reminded of this afternoon, oh, yeah, it's in your strength. It's his strength, Andy, you dummy. It's like, oh, and now... Now for me, I want to walk in that truth. And so I want, to, I want to get that scripture in me, that truth, not to memorize a verse, but to internalize a truth. I, I want to ask the Spirit to just put that, soak me in the reality of that. Train my soul and train my mind to think differently, to, to walk, to live differently. I want to have brothers and sisters who can, who can remind me of it day by day by day so that when the next opportunity comes, and the old tape starts playing. This is about you, Andy. This is about your strength. You don't have what it takes. I can come back to, wait a second. Isn't it true that his grace is sufficient for me? And his power is actually made perfect in my weakness? Game, set, match. And so bit by bit, we begin to win more days than we lose. And God's kingdom begins to advance, not only in our lives, but through them too. Amen.